Welcome back to the Something in the Wilderness podcast. My name's Steve, and today with me, I have two guests that are new to the show. They were on the holiday from Real Cruise recently, and I wanted to give a few different perspectives on how this cruise went. I think this episode will be good for people who are on the cruise to kind of reflect and think back on uh, on the experience they had on their own. But also, I think it's going to be good for people who weren't on the cruise just to kind of hear. We're going to try to cover some of those things that I think that people that weren't on the ship would want to know uh, how certain things went. So welcome, Mike and Madeline. Thank you guys for joining me. Hello. Hi. Thank you. So let's start off with you guys introducing yourselves. We'll have Madeline go first and just tell us who you are. Yeah, so I'm Madeline. I hail from North Carolina by way of New Jersey. I've been an Andrew fan for most of my life at this point. And I'm just, I'm happy to be here. I've been listening to your podcast for quite a while. So you're like a local celebrity to me. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Like world of influence. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. It's, um, it's funny, you know, you hit record and you talk and then you put it out there and sometimes you get, you know, people respond and tell you, Hey, I'm listening. And sometimes you don't hear from some of those people. So you're like, I wonder who's all listening. So, so it's always nice to meet people who are listening, but Mainly, I mean, I've said it a million times on here, but the reason I do this is to meet other Andrew McMahon fans and and talk about what we're passionate about. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, All right, Mike, how about you? A similar experience of uh, getting to cross paths with you, Steve. I was was like, oh my gosh, this is Steve here from (laughs) the podcast. And so excited for that. But I'm, I'm Mike Gentis. I am living between Denver and Rochester, Minnesota right now. I recently moved to Rochester a few months ago for a job and my family, which is my wife, Megan, our one-year-old daughter, and my mother are holding the fort back in Denver as we work on all the moving pieces of selling our home and relocating here and everything in between that. Okay. And, and when did you become an Andrew fan? What, what what was your entry point? So my my origin story into the Andrew verse was one that that took the better part of two years for me to be converted on the Andrew train or whatever terrible cult saying fits. <laughs> um, the The first time I had heard Andrew's music, I had recently gotten my first job. I was 15 years old. I was living in um, the Clearwater St. Pete area in Florida, and I wasn't old enough to have my driver's license yet. So some nights after work, one of my coworkers, Mary, um, she'd become a friend and she was a year or two older. And she would drive a few of us home. And and one night, a group of us had gone to the gym together after work. And on our drive home after the gym, with a few of us in the car, Mary casually goes, Michael, I, I think you're really going to like this album. And the crazy thing was, it was, it was spring 2005. Um, so she had somehow gotten an advanced or leaked copy of everything in transit, which I, I don't think I realized at the time hadn't come out yet, but I was fixated. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I remember so vividly hearing I'm ready and rescued. And when Mary dropped me off at home that night, I immediately went to our computer. I tried finding the songs on LimeWire to no avail. And then the day or two later, I, I had forgotten all about it. And I guess I had moved on. Fast forward two years later, a different friend had, um, we were hanging out one afternoon and then he kind of in the same vein of Mary goes, Mike, I, I think you're really going to like this. And um, he put in Punko's Acoustic 2, mm-hmm. which had the bruised uh, version of it on it. And and that that solidified my my fandom. <laughs> Great. Uh, how about you, Madeline? Where, like, where did you come in on, on yeah. you said all your life? Most of it. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually such an interesting little, you know, synchronicity, Michael, because my entry was also in a friend's car and it was everything in transit. I also couldn't, I didn't have my license at the time. So I had one of my older friends, like I was hitching a ride to school in the morning. And I remember like one day we were just in line, like the car line. And he's like, oh, you should listen to this song. And he put on dark blue. And I was like, this is going to be my personality for the rest of my life. Um, and ironically, my friend's name was Andrew. So meant to be. So shout out to A-Rod. <laughs> like, appreciate the jams. And Mary, wherever you are. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> That's neat. I've heard that, you know, a similar story in that friends introduced you to Andrew McMahon. I don't know that I really had that. I feel like I just like wandered across them at Warp Tour and then like followed Andrew, whatever he did after from there. So it was interesting. I, I, I think I'm a little unique in that respect in this fan base where 
I wasn't, I didn't feel surrounded by Andrew McMahon fans uh, in my friend group. Lana, they were into all kinds of different music. I had my kind of grunge friends. I had my college friends that were more into pop music. And so it, it's just interesting to me. So when I went to Andrew shows in, in my younger years, I was like kind of going on my own, like Warp Tour kind of stuff. I'd be like sometimes dragging friends out like, oh, come on, it'll, it'll be fun. Like, but I didn't, I didn't have that like pop punk group or that like Andrew fan group, friend group. So. Hence, maybe maybe that's why I created a podcast <laughs> to meet people that were like minded and had similar music tastes. I don't know, but now I I seem to know more people that are into Andrew, which is awesome. So good people to surround yourself with, in my opinion, which I definitely want to talk about because uh, that's what we saw on the ship. So did you guys have you guys ever ever been on a cruise before? This um, was was cruising new to you? Completely. I'd always been one of those people up to this point where I was like. I just don't see why anyone would go on a cruise. Like, why would you spend all that money to be on a boat when you could just pay it to go to the actual island, just stay there? And then I saw the announcement. I was like, well, I could be convinced. (laughs) Yeah, same. I, having spent most of my childhood and early adult years in Florida, you would think I'd be cruising, you know, at least once a year, but uh, no, this was my, my first go around and I had actually never been out of the country before. Um, we had a few false starts that the pandemic threw off. Um, so, so this was a, a two first for me here. Okay. And interestingly, I, you know, growing up in the Midwest and living on the East coast for a little bit, I had been on cruises, but it wasn't until more recently. And it was about six years ago, I went on a family cruise and don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. I don't want to speak bad ill about that experience because I did, but I kind of felt similarly to maybe the way you guys perceived cruises. It's like, well, it was fine, but like, yeah, I'd rather just go on vacation to the place where I want to go on vacation and just hang out there. It was nice. It was different. I honestly didn't know that I'd ever go back on another cruise until the rock boat introduced me to the life, the, the sixth man music cruise lifestyle let's just say, and I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to harp too much on, on my rock boat experience, but that, that is where it began for me. So that's, that's kind of where, where I came into music cruises. And then from there, I've been on several now, but yeah, it's interesting. I've never, I never sought out cruises prior to that. So I was never like, I'm going to be a cruise person. I didn't, I thought quite the opposite actually. What was your first rock boat? If I can ask. Yeah, it was 2021. And that was the second one Andrew McMahon was on. So he referenced it at one of the sets on the boat that we were on that he uh, was a headliner on two different sixth man cruises. I had never even heard of the rock boat prior, which is interesting because he was on the 2019 edition. I didn't even know it existed. I didn't know there were, you know, then I found out that year that, oh, Weezer had their own cruise at one point and there was a Warp Tour Rewind cruise at one point. And now they've created several more since that point. But it it was just like, how is it this whole world that I didn't know anything about? And honestly, Mike, I, um, because I know you have a, a, a young child, I kind of equate, I kind of blame that on the fact that when I had young children 10 years ago, because they're a little bit older than they're now both over 10, I was like, I think I was just in this headspace where I wasn't even looking for that sort of thing. So it's like I completely missed all that was going on in that, you know, in the in the 20 teens, if you will. And then when the pandemic opened up, we were like, we've got to do something. What are we going to do? Oh, Andrew McMahon's ho- headlining on a cruise. That's what we're doing now. And so that's kind of how we, we jumped into into it, so to speak. So. Again, didn't think I'd be a cruise person, but um, cruises are different from music cruises, and you guys don't have as much basis for comparison, but I'll talk a little bit about that. I don't consider this a cruise as much as it's a music festival happens to be on a cruise ship, but yeah. Uh, what, when you guys first heard about this, so you, you kind of alluded to it, Madeline, but when you first heard about this cruise uh, that Andrew McMahon would be hosting, what was your reaction? It sounds like you were like, I'm all in right away, but like... Were you hesitant? Were you, was this like a, I'm going for sure? And then did you have to like, wh- whomever you went with, did you have to be like, kind of convince them or, or what was that like? So I, I saw the announcement and I immediately texted my boyfriend, Pete, he's who came with me. And I was like, we're going. And he has now, you know, joined the, again, quote, unquote, cult of Andrew McMahon, <laughs> originally by force. And now he's a believer. And I told him, I was like, we're going on this cruise. He's like, it's a year from now. We don't know what we're going to be doing. Like, we don't know what our finances are going to be. I'm like, it's fine. We'll figure it out. And I had one of the like earlier bookings, I guess, to like the camp wilderness access. So I got my booking time, got on, I put my card information. I was like, well, we'll figure it out from here. <laughs> there was no hesitation. I was just like, give me a room and we'll make it work. So yeah. there was no hesitation, even though, like I said, up till that point in my life, I was like, 
I would never go on a cruise. Mm-hmm. But here I am within the first 500 bookings. How about you, Mike? Madeline, was, was the announcement you were talking about, was that the um, like the QR tease or was it the actual cruise announcement? I have no idea oh. how I found out about this, but I found out about it in time where I was like signing up now. <laughs> That's right, Mike. Oh, um, yeah. It's interesting you referenced that because I forgot that happened. I was in Vegas for the when we were young, late show, pre-show, whatever you want to call it, at House of Blues. And yeah, they put up that QR code saying all three bands, they listed all three bands next year for a weekend. And everybody's like, what is this? But there had already been rumors among the fan base. I had heard that maybe there's going to be an Andrew Cruz. And I was like, maybe that's it. Or maybe they're doing like some kind of residency type thing. So yeah, that's the first place I heard of something like that, if that's what you're referring to. I was. I think even before that, I had just forgotten about it until this moment, but either through Camp Wilderness or Instagram, Andrew had put out a survey a year or two ago around interest in a cruise. And I I don't think I had quite put two and two together of that survey happening sometime before and then seeing the announcement at the Something Corporate show. I I was not there, but there was a live stream of it. Um, Mm -hmm. And immediately, much of the same way as Madeline, I was like, well, we're going, we have plans in whenever this happens <laughs> and um and the, the rest is kind of history from there i think i think uh we probably got our booking time also through camp wilderness that early mm-hmm. access as well which was great very helpful that apparently helped because some a lot of people didn't get their their cabin initially i know there was a wait list and eventually some of those people made it on but yeah initially i know there was a lot of panic like oh my like people outside camp wilderness were like i could not book because i didn't have that that code to book so i was I felt like that paid for Camp Wilderness for my year right there, just like getting that early access. So I was happy with Same. that. A lot of this will make more context, or it'll add context to later in you know, our conversation. I have essentially no social media presence. I use it very intermittently. I'm primarily on Reddit, which not the best place for like Andrew references. And then I'll kind of skim Instagram now and then. So I, if I don't see it in Camp Wilderness, I have no idea it's happening, at least in, you know, the universe. Okay. And that's why I have social media is to keep updated on things like that. Like I can't imagine, unfortunately can't imagine with my life without social media because I feel like I'd miss these things. I have, I have a friend who lives down the street from me that we eventually found out was an Andrew McMahon fan, which I just thought that was so awesome. We ended up going to a show a few years ago together. She's no Facebook, no Instagram, none of that. No, that doesn't never even looked at it. And she doesn't know any of this stuff's going on. So I'm like, yeah, we're going on an Andrew McMahon cruise later this year. There's an Andrew McMahon cruise. And I'm like, wait, you don't know? Uh, But I mean, if you don't look, if you're not online. So it's just fascinating to me that there are a lot of people that, like I met people on the cruise that, uh, and maybe you guys don't know this either. There's a We Are The Pop Underground Facebook group. And there's fans that don't even know that exists. I didn't know until four years ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I've only been in it the past two years. I think I was in line yeah. one day at, before a concert, and uh-huh. somebody was like, "How are you not part of this?" Um, yeah, I just assumed everybody was. <laughs> I don't think I've accessed my Facebook in about two years, so I have no idea. But I, I did learn my lesson with this cruise, and I do now have my Instagram, and I have certain notifications turned on. So, lesson learned. So, Madeline, I it was actually via Reddit I found out. So, I posted there when I was starting this podcast four years ago. And I said, I'm looking for, you know, a place where Andrew McMahon fans gather online. And someone's like, you got to join We Are The Pop Underground. And I, you know, I don't remember her username, but I eventually became friends with that person. She's since been on this podcast and we spent, we even hung out a lot on the cruise. So it kind of came full circle. She was the one that told me about that group and how I kind of became more involved in the fan base. So it was just kind of a, it's just kind of a neat full circle thing. But yeah, I did start on Reddit, like asking questions. That's when I joined Reddit in 2020. I was like, Mm -hmm. where do people go to like gather in these fan bases? And um, I found out there's a few different places. So that's how I found you. I think you posted like a post at one point to the effect of like, hey, I'm just starting this podcast. If you want to give it a listen, please do. And I was like, and now here we are. (laughs) Oh, awesome. I'm I'm glad someone saw that. Wow. That's pretty cool. Madeline, you said that you brought your boyfriend, Pete, um, and he's since become a fan. How about you, Mike? Um, who did you bring with you? Who did you cruise with? Yeah, d- directly, um, my wife, Megan, came along, and and probably much like you, Steve, it was the logistics of, like, we have a daughter. How do we leave her with someone? Do we bring her with us? What does that look like? 
But my my brother-in-law and his wife, Sean and Kayla, um, they're Andrew McMahon fans as well. And so we were able to like think through and assemble camp grandma for their kids and for our daughter. And um, and then we all got to go on the cruise together. So <laughs> that That's was wild. our, our little quad. But we also have um, living in Denver, we have a, a Dear Jack fundraising team that we've gotten to assemble over the past few years. And most of our, our team was on this cruise as well. And so even though we all traveled separately, it was it was so fun to have our little corner of folks from all across the country <laughs> on one place one time. I forgot that you told me that on the ship when we met. So what's your team name for Dear Jack? Yeah, so our team name is Couch Choir. Okay, and um, I've heard of you guys, so I'm, I'm familiar with... Uh... <laughs> the stuff you guys post on social media, but I didn't know that was you prior to that. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like I can't take any credit. This year, our, our team um, raised the most, which is really exciting. That's right. That's um, why I know that name. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I take very little part, having been largely distracted throughout the move. But throughout the, the years, we've we've rallied around Dear Jack. We've had a few faces come and go from the team. Um, but it's been, it's been in some ways, like solidified our, our enjoyment of concerts with Andrew Moore because of this little community we have. And, um, and so to, to have more than just eight hours in line together, we now had, you know, multiple days on the cruise. So it was so fun getting to, to have all our friends in one place. I can relate to that for sure. Kind of tightening the the circle with, with that sort of activity. Um, that reminds me of something you just said. So you, so it sounds like you've waited in line for Andrew shows, uh, which I haven't done a whole lot to be honest, but the friends I've made in the, in recent years are wait in line types. So it's it kind of encouraged me to, they're like, Oh, it's fun. Madeline, do you do any of that? Do, have you ever waited in line for shows or is that like not, not a thing? I, I have previously, I think I've only waited in line for maybe one or two Andrew shows. Mm-hmm. I waited like once for like a summer stage show in Asbury Park, like back in like 2011, maybe earlier. Uh huh. It was it was it was fun. I guess it was nice to be like right up against the front, like right there. But yeah. I'm more of like a jump around and dance in the back where I can't bother anybody with my like <laughs> antics kind of girl. So I'm God. happy to be a little bit farther back and just kind of be able to do my own thing rather than like the bum rush to the stage. Yeah, and, and I asked that question after Mike said that. It reminded me to ask that question because. Um, I will touch back to that point because, yeah, I, I've typically in my history of going to concerts just in general, Andrew or otherwise, uh, I kind of like the flexibility to move around. I like being able to stand in one place and be like, oh, I think I'll go over here now. Oh, I got to go use the bathroom. Oh, I might grab something from the bar. I, I like that flexibility. I never understood like being tied to one spot. But I, under I also now understand the social dynamic of being with a, gr a passionate group of people. So that's why I asked anyway. All right, let's talk about getting to Miami. Let's jump let's jump into this this piece of the vacation. So, did you both arrive on Friday or Saturday? Did you do anything in Miami leading up to it? Anything like with other other people you were with? I so my my brother-in-law and his wife, they live um in St. Augustine, Florida, which is like the northern part of the West Coast and yeah. East Coast. And um so we got in Thursday to have some time with them and to make sure uh, my mother-in-law and his mother-in-law were all good to go. And, and of course they were. But so we we didn't do any pre-gaming or Miami partying, just uh, uh, hanging out in St. Augustine and then making the trip down on Saturday morning before the adventure began. Cool. Yeah, we had a whole road trip. So we were coming from like central North Carolina and it was just far enough that we were like, we could do this drive in two days because I wasn't going to get air, a flight because I've had really bad experiences lately with airlines. So I was like, I'm not risking it. So we did mm -hmm. one drive down to Jacksonville, which is probably about like seven hours. We stayed at an Airbnb. Shout out to Vicky at Cardinal Cove. You need to book with her if you're ever in Jacksonville for like a night. They're amazing. Anyway, okay. so then we drove from Jacksonville down to Fort Lauderdale because Pete has a bunch of like hotel points from work. So we were able to like cash those in. They could stretch farther there than Miami. And yeah, getting back to like the lack of social media, I saw, I think it was Jess's post about the bar crawl like that night. And I emailed her. I was like, I would love to be there. Tell me more information. She sent the logistics. I was like, that's like an hour or so drive each way. I'm not trying to lose any of my already like gradually decreasing energy levels as I age right off the bat before the cruise even starts. So mm -hmm. we didn't do anything fun necessarily, but the road trip itself was an adventure. <laughs> I mean, road trips are fun in themselves. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. 
I got to say, I um, I had no, and I've had airline issues as well, um, nothing too serious, just like your typical delays and uh, annoyances. But I, I got to say, I told my wife after, I waited until after we got back to Ohio to tell her this because I, I didn't want to like, like jinx us. But I was like, I can't believe how smooth all that travel went. Getting on the flight to Miami, getting to our hotel, getting down to the port, and then backwards all the way back to Ohio. I was like, no problems at all with baggage, no problems with delays. It was just like incredible. I don't know that I've ever had a trip that was like quite perfect and all that. So I was relieved. But I organized a uh, hotel lobby get together for Andrew fans because we were we had a block of rooms at the AC Hotel Brickle. Uh, shout out to um, a different Jess. So um, the Jess you mentioned, I'll come back to. But there's a different Jess in the fan group who's a travel agent. This is just so everybody knows, it's difficult to book a block of rooms in Miami, especially on a weekend. They don't really want to do that for obvious reasons. They're busy already. But Jess somehow made it happen. She worked a lot on that, and she got us a pretty good deal, what I thought was a pretty good deal, uh, with a nice hotel, had a rooftop pool that we got to enjoy, because we did get there early in the day, and that was kind of intentional. I wanted to get there early, enjoy the area. We thought we were going to go down to like Miami Beach, but... By the time we got there at 11 or noon, we were like, okay, there's just not, not enough time before. I had this happy hour organized at 4 o'clock in the lobby. So we kind of hung out at the pool, met up with some fans out by the pool. Like, you can just kind of tell sometimes, like, people are wearing their SoCo stuff and their, you know, their gear. And we're like, okay, those people are with this group. But it was neat to be already be in a group of Andrew fans right there at the hotel. And then there were about, I'd say, 20 people or so that came, maybe less, maybe 15 to 20 people who came to the bar and just hung out. That was a lot of fun. And, and we met some of the initial people we met on the cruise were at that very meetup, let's call it. So, But I feel like we packed a lot in, uh, maybe that we shouldn't have, because we also committed to Jess and Jimmy's uh, uh, bar crawl, which was cool. Um, I'm really glad they did that. Shout out to them for putting that together. I know they put a lot of work into it. I could tell because it was very well organized. Like There was four different uh, venues we went to, and then we spent a certain amount of time at each and just kind of like, Hung out with other Andrew fans, and I think we all, yeah, we all had like necklaces, like bead necklaces, so we knew who at the bar was with this group. But to be honest, we kind of in that atmosphere, we kind of like hung out with the people we came with. So I came to answer a question I asked you guys earlier. I went on the boat with my wife, and then we met up with our friends who we'd met on the rock boat the year we saw Andrew. Uh, their names are Andrea and Nathan, and we hung out with them most of the week, uh, and we hadn't seen them in like a year and a half, so. Um, we were excited to uh, reconnect with them. So we mostly just hung out with them at the bars uh, and kind of followed the group and uh, kind of did things on our own a little bit. But uh, And we made it an early night um, because like Madeline pointed out, like you don't, we're all getting older. You don't want to go hard like the night before the cruise. That's, you know, I didn't go hard. I don't think I went hard any night until I would say the last night, but just because I wanted to save my energy, I didn't want to like be spent and not enjoy the cruise. So I think we were back in our room by 10 o'clock, uh, which I thought was reasonable. And we got like, more than eight hours of sleep and and all that so uh, but it was cool it, it was cool to kind of connect with people before the cruise and that was that was one of my goals with, with all with doing all of that kind of previewing for the boat i know like somebody posted and, and madeline you may have missed this because uh you don't do the social media thing but people do on these music cruises and that's i guess at some concerts in general now people do th this thing called swag swap and they they like make things or print stickers or magnets or some kind of thing, make bracelets. A lot of people make bracelets. Did either of you do any of that, participate in any of that uh, pre-cruise, like make stuff? I was such a fuddy-duddy. I don't know if I was using the excuse that I'm like living out of six or seven duffel bags right now while my that's, life that's is legit. in two stages. <laughs> Pretty legit. Um, and I was just feeling grateful that I was able to pack for the cruise. Um, and and in hindsight, I mean, kind of seeing the way that everybody went out with swag, with 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 even theme nights, even mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I, I I could step up my game here on a future cruise. But now I I did not do much of anything other than pack my flip flops and bathing suit. Yeah, <laughs> understandable. How about you, <laughs> Madeline? Did you bring anything extra, or just stick to like, here's what I need for this thing? I did exactly what you thought I would do. I Because I didn't have social media, I did not know the swag swap was a thing, which is such a shame because I I went to a Taylor Swift Eras tour stop Ooh. last year or so. So I have so many friendship bracelet making supplies. I have beads, I have string, I have all of it just sitting here with nothing to do. And I made so many bracelets for the Taylor Swift show and I would have had 
such a field day making some for an Andrew McMahon crew. So I'm really sad I didn't know. But again, lesson learned. I need to use social media, but, you know, as long as it's just via choice notifications. Maybe you're in the right without social media. It can it can be helpful, but it can also be the opposite. Mm hmm. I was just going to say how I, I shouldn't be surprised with how like kind this fandom is, but so many folks were like, you didn't, you didn't bring anything. That's fine here. I still want you to have this and take this and, and enjoy this. And, um, and, and for all the people that were giving away that everybody was like that. It was incredible and maybe a little unexpected on my part. Yeah. I saw that come over from the other music cruises. Like I did, I thought that was a specific rock boat thing, but I found out they do it on a lot of the six man cruises. Cause I talked to the woman who organized it on our boat and she said, no, I go on the emo's not dead. And like, I don't know, I can't remember the name of the other one she mentioned, but she's like, no, we do it on all of these. And I'm like, okay. I, I gave out podcast stickers. So I come to simple and, and very on theme for myself on brand, I guess. I, I made these new podcast stickers and new design I was excited about. So I, I handed a bunch of those out. I found like a, good website uh, that printed them fairly cheaply. Also, um, some friends in the fan base that I've made in the last couple of years, and I made this 72-foot Constantine bracelet, necklace, rosary. Uh, I guess even Andrew started calling it a rosary, which was kind of a joke in our in our group. But um, we had we had info cards made. Some of the ladies and the, and the women in the group had these info cards made with extra beads left over from the project attached that we could hand out. So that's what I was doing on day one. Uh, which was kind of funny because like there's nine of us and I had to explain to everybody. It's not just mine. Like there was like nine people who put this thing, nine or 10 people who put this thing together and it was mailed across different states. And like, there's a whole story and here, check out the website on this QR codes <laughs> that they put together. So Jenna, the one I mentioned earlier, who actually was on Reddit four years ago to get me into the, we are the pop underground group is part of this. And she made this website that explains the whole thing. So I'll, I'll link that in the show notes. If anybody wants to check that out, it's, it, it's a, it's a funny story, but also um, just kind of the message and the theme of Andrew fans being so cool and wanting to get together and do something funny, but also like kind of bond together as well. So that, I feel like that really bonded our group and, and almost every one of them were on the cruise um, except for one person. So Madeline, you mentioned earlier, you weren't a cruise person. We still do have a friend who's, just as hardcore of an Andrew fan as any of us, he's like, don't do cruises. We'll never do a cruise. And I'm like, fair enough. Like some people just won't do a cruise. But anyway, yeah. So we, so I brought that and, and gave those things out. So, all right, let's talk about, let's talk about the lineup here. So besides Andrew's bands coming into this thing, were there any other artists that you, the two of you, either of you knew you needed to see like a, mu like a must see besides the obvious Andrew? At the top of my list was Augustana. We had been such Augustana fans for, gosh, probably as long as we've been Andrew fans and have um, have gotten to see Dan, who, who's the, the lead singer and songwriter, and his various incarnations of the band and his solo projects. And, and really, I, I feel like the last few years as his... Um, touring lineup has changed a little bit. They're just, they're sounding so tight live and it's so good. And they just put out a new record this year that is phenomenal. And we missed them on on their tour through Denver earlier this year. And so it was, um, we were so excited to, to make up for some lost shows on this cruise. Cool. Yeah, Mike, are, are we just the same person in different incarnations? <laughs> <laughs> because I was, um, you know, Pete, we were also like, so excited for Augustana. Like I say, I've been following him slash them probably as long, if not earlier than I've been following Andrew. So I've again, seen all his incarnations. We've, you know, done the whole thing and yeah, we also missed the, you know, something beautiful tour too. So I was like, I have to go see, I have to go see Dan and all of his, you know, bandmates. And I also had a really strong need to see Mr. Wives because I've been following them also since probably close to their, inception back in 2014 15 and i knew it was their last go round before they took a break for a while so i was like i gotta see them off i gotta go see their last show have all the energy so those were probably my top two pete's top two were augustana and cartel nice okay i it sounds like we, this is all fitting right here in this circle because um now the top bands that i came to see besides andrews were uh, augustana jukebox the ghost and cartel I would say there was a point in life um, for years, probably, that I was a 
maybe a bigger cartel fan than Jack's mannequin even. Like I was a huge cartel fan. And I would say the only reason that may have faded slightly is because they haven't been real active in the last 10 years. So to be fair, but I am a huge cartel fan. Augustana, I've been more of a fringe fan for a while, but I will say I did see the Something Beautiful tour uh, at the beginning of October. And there was a couple of really interesting things about that show. Firstly, it was kind of a last minute decision. I think I bought a ticket the day of, and it was just Dan Leis on a piano. And I don't know if that's whole, how the whole tour went, and I didn't know what to expect. I know that he tours that way sometimes, but he also tours with a full band. But I got there, it was just Dan on a piano, and it was a very small group of people. And to justify that, I counted, I looked at the schedule. There were five different concerts going in on going on in Columbus, Ohio that night. Jelly Roll, Pink, Matthew Sweet was in town. There was some play going on as well down the street, and there was one other. It was like a ridiculous, not everybody even comes to Columbus, Ohio. I feel like we're a secondary market. And everyone was in town, so like the arenas were literally full of of music fans. And Dan was at this like smaller club. Um, which I really appreciated. It was a very intimate setting, very intimate show, uh, just him and a piano, and it was lovely. It was amazing. Um, I actually didn't know that he'd have a full band on the ship. I just assumed that he was going to come with just him on a piano, but I was glad to see they did both. Something Beautiful is possibly my favorite Augustana album as a whole. There's a couple of songs I like better in the earlier work individually, but I think as a whole, I love his new album. It's amazing. He shared... um a note about it at some point when the record was being released that the track order of the album is the order in which the songs came to him and and he decided that all right i've got to start and finish and this is it and um and i I think it just did whether that makes it a concept album or not i don't i don't think so but nice little tidbit about it cool yeah the the evolution of dan leyes and augustana is so interesting like it's such a such a cool little journey, I guess, to witness from the outside, maybe not so from his perspective in some cases, but yeah, it's been really cool to like follow his development as like a musician and artist and all his different like projects. Like he's doing stuff with like symphonies. He has his own yeah. like solo album of just like classical piano. It's, uh-huh. it's, it's insane. Well, and, and much like Dan Leis is, is the lead singer of Cartel. Is that Will Pugh? Yeah. Like, both of them have no business sounding this good for as long as they have sounded this good. I was so floored away. I, I had not seen Cartel live before, but have, have adored Chroma. And um, and hearing them live, I was just like, how have you kept your voices so incredibly perfect for the decades you've been in this work? Yeah, I don't get it. Um, Will, Will Pugh is a great example, and I've seen other people post about that. It's like, how does he... Uh, kind of look he kind of looks the same but he sounds exactly like he did 20 years ago like how do you do that with your voice the same for 20 years mm-hmm. i have no idea that was yeah me and pete we had the same experience we had like a cartel reawakening at the <sighs> gone days tour that they did with uh dashboard confessional oh we, yeah we hadn't probably like seriously been listening to cartel for a while at that point and we saw and like you know we caught them opening and we both looked at them and we're like how does he sound that good i'm like it's been decades i'm like what is this man doing with his vocal cords to have such like pristine vocals all this time out speaking of chroma so that was um one of my top shows to see in terms of looking forward to i mean um that was one of the ones i really really wanted to see like a lot of people i I knew it was going to be real popular real well attended q and a the last two tracks so one's called q one's called a for non-cartel fans are my favorite combination of songs in one of my favorite combination of songs on an album of all time. Like I, I may like that better than Constantine, which I know is, uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of long songs, I know most people would be like, what? But like that, that one hits for me so much. So I had to see that live again. I saw their 10 years of Chroma in 2015 in Columbus. Uh, again, not everybody comes to Columbus, but that tour actually did. I was very lucky and to see the 20 years, you know, almost 20 years of Chroma as well was pretty special on the boat. So I was definitely looking forward to that. I, one of my hobbies is I love collecting CDs mm-hmm. and I will still rip CDs onto my computer and then sync them to my phone. And um, my car is just old enough that it has like some smart capabilities. But whenever I plug in my phone, it plays songs alphabetically. And so even to this day, I plug in my phone, A, 
comes on. It happens to me multiple times a week. Um, and having never heard that song live before up until this cruise, I, I felt like I was like, it was a iPhone rite of passage to be able to, to hear it in all of its glory and not through my car speakers as I'm trying to switch to the radio or something. I, I will say I was disappointed with the lack of piano on stage because, um, which is ironic because everyone else, I think everyone else had a piano, uh, on that ship, but, uh, cartel did not. And I love the piano in a, but yeah, I mean, I could, I could talk all day about cartel chroma and Q and a, but I was also really looking to forward to hundred of Blanc's pop punk piano show. Uh, and that delivered. And I definitely want to talk about that in a bit here. And then we kind of already covered this, or maybe we didn't. I don't know. Uh, were there artists that you guys kind of studied up on? Like, okay, I need to find out more about this artist because I'm going to see them on the ship. Do you, do you guys do that for opening acts and things like that? I try sometimes. I I don't think I did much of that on this cruise, maybe other than some jukebox. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly when, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the Wasted track that they had collabed Oh, yeah. with Andrew on. And so... Um, But no, I, I really didn't do much of it, but also because it so much of the music I already knew and loved, right? You know, of Zach's and Bobby's and I, I refreshed my memory on like Zach, Bobby's, all that. Wildermiss, Wildermiss, we had we'd only really known since the last couple tours that he did with them. So I definitely kind of dug a little bit deeper into like their discography. But for the most part, same as you, Mike, like we were just kind of along for the ride and we were going to try to just go with the flow. I wish I could relax a little bit more about this stuff, but I always feel the need to prepare like, oh, I don't know every one of Mr. Wives songs. I need to listen to them more because I like what I know and I'd seen them in concert before. But I'm like, I got to listen to the new stuff, get familiar. And I wish I wouldn't like put that on myself, <laughs> be a little bit more relaxed about it. But I did. But I did like Wilderness. I listened to more than I would have probably Mr. Wives. And then the Academy is uh, so the, the friends I made um, the Constantine bracelet with. Some of them are really into the Academy, isn't it? Like, you you don't know that band? And I, I really didn't before a year and a half ago, two years ago, maybe. And so I kind of studied up on them. I'm like, I'm going to listen to the Academy, as and I can see the appeal. I understand why people who like this kind of music like the Academy, as it, it makes sense now. And I got to meet um, William Beckett at the airport on our way out, out of Miami. <laughs> he just happened to be at the same terminal because our my friends were flying back to Chicago, and so was he. So we were all hanging out and... He was, there he was. And they're just like, oh, hey, hey, William, how you doing? Like, just so crazy. But well, let's talk about unique experiences here in a bit. What did your, so people want to know that didn't go on the ship. What did like a normal day, if you will, is there a normal day? I don't know. What's like a normal day on the ship? I don't know how the answer will differ for both y'all, but as a parent, sleeping in till like seven is a big deal and is considered sleeping in. And so we, we would often get up pretty early. We ended up kind of one of the big splurges on the ship that we went for was the Mandera Thermal Suite Spa, which gave you access to, you know, the, the whirlpools and the front of the ship that you could overlook. The beautiful morning, there were steam rooms and a sauna, um, and it was about $140 for the trip. So in some ways, like a little steep for four days, but it really drove me to be like, I have to get my money's worth out of this. I have to go at least once for an hour in the morning. But it was it was kind of the perfect spot to just hang out. It was so quiet. I wonder if, if any um, female listeners who also did the spa had the same experience, but like the guy's side was completely empty most of the time and so it felt like this like little corner of the front of the ship that you had to yourself and i i, I generally like consider myself an extrovert but I, I need my alone time too and so it was like the little escape that i had that wasn't our our cabin and so that was what a lot of my mornings look like we're taking it slow and, and hanging out in the spa That is honestly not the not the answer I expected, but that's that's what's so cool about having two different people with two different experiences on here is like, I've never even considered that. Uh, did you say 140 total for the whole week for a person? That's not bad. Yeah, it wasn't bad. So you couldn't get in the first day, that, but it opened up, I think, at 8 a.m. on um, the first day and, and was open till 8 most other days, too, I think. Okay. That spa, well noted for next time, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, we did probably more, Steve, what you might have expected, where I, like, I get up early already for work and stuff, so I just woke up most of the time at, you know, seven or eight in the morning, and unlike Mike, who had the, you know, foresight to 
ease into the day of chaos. I woke up and I was like, we're going, we're doing stuff. I was like already planning right around the boat. And poor Pete is like more of an introvert, like, and I'm more of an extrovert. So he's like, okay. And we didn't really get into a good rhythm on the boat for activities and kind of balancing our like energy, I guess, until like the last day or so. Cause the first day, you know, aside from Saturday, which was just getting on the boat was enough where I was like, I need to breathe for a second. Yeah. But like the first couple of days, it was like, we felt so like such a sense of like FOMO to get do everything all the time, mm -hmm. not miss anything. Mm -hmm. We didn't realize that most bands other than Andrew's bands were going to play mostly the same set every time. So we were trying to get every single band that we could in every single day. And it wasn't until the second or third day where we we're like, oh, we could also just relax on this cruise. Like we don't have to be doing all the things all the time and stressing ourselves out to a point that it's like not even fun sometimes. Not saying we didn't have fun, we had blast. It was just, I wish we had kind of slowed it down at a time because that first day was such a roller coaster and there was so much going on that the second day it was like almost, I got up and I was like, okay, we're doing it again. I had to like prepare myself to like yeah. go, 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 go. And then by the last day it was like, we were just like sitting on that like big balcony in the back of where that one dining area was like yep. at night just like drinking some wine and hanging out i was like we could have been doing this more often <laughs> so <laughs> it was definitely you know a lesson in i guess moderation as far as energy levels and activities go yeah it's interesting you mentioned that so madeline my experience was much like that except i have done this before so you'd think i would have learned my lesson three but two boats ago uh two rock boats ago but i I just can't, it's hard for me to sit still. And my, and my friends know this and it's a joke, you know, with the, the friends we met on rock boat, they're like, Steve's just going to be running around. Like he's going to be like, I got to go here. I got to be here there. And then it's, it is, it's, it's a lot of FOMO. That's a lot of it. I, I feel like I have to, oh my gosh, that, you know, I, I love cartel. I love Augustana. I love jukebox, the ghost. How do I choose? I, I, they're all playing at the same time sometimes. So that was tough. So I kind of had to make a schedule and that's why I liked having the whole schedule in front of me at once, like that I could flip through because I could say, okay, I have to catch Augustana on the last day because I didn't catch them earlier in the week. And so that gives me permission to go to jukebox, the ghost during this time earlier in the week. So my day was more like yours where it's getting up early and then frantically like, oh my gosh, where are we going? Look at the schedule. Even though I studied this thing like weeks leading into it, I still don't know what we're doing today. What's everybody else doing like that we know? So I had the Wi-Fi package uh, so we could communicate with our kids, but it also came in real handy communicating with other people on the ship that did have it. it it's hard because it's I'd love to be disconnected, but the reality was I kind of knew things that were going on around me because... I was communicating with other people on the ship at the same time, whereas I'd love to disconnect, not have that at all. But then I felt like I would have missed things. Um, so again, it's all part of my personality. It's like, I gotta, I gotta know everything that's going on so I can do everything possible. But I like you on the last day, Madeline, and I wish I could have relaxed a bit more. I, I wish this every time. And there were times I just, I had to force myself to, I was like, I'm going to eat a meal right now with my wife and our two friends uh, that we're with. We're going to just relax. But I was like, constant battle in my mind like but there's a concert going on right now how could i be down here while bobby is playing a set right now and you know i could be watching that i had to choose to miss it um i only saw hunter de blanc one of the nights uh i had full intentions of going each night but i had to eat at some point <laughs> and so like i saw a friend we had made in the in the garden cafe and she was like running through there grabbing food she's like i'll see you at hunter de blanc and i was like yeah i'll see you down there and i was like never made it and i was like I can't do it all. I have to eat too. Mm -hmm. For me, it was more like running from thing to thing. I, I wish I had time to meditate in the in the spa. I didn't take that time. That's like a really interesting way to start your day though, Mike, that I wish I gave myself the space for. Yeah, I'm not, I, I think I ran into some of the similar scheduling challenges in the afternoon and evening that y'all did. And like in hindsight, if I, if I hadn't made that time in the morning, I don't know if I just like... <laughs> If, if I could have had the stamina to make it through the rest of the day. I did have to tell myself at one point, and this was in Augustana was the prime example, to be honest. I had to tell myself, if I see each of these bands once, it will have been successful. And so I, I had to give myself permission that I'm going to see Augustana, and that's my top priority on the last day. I have to see that show because I didn't see him earlier in the week. I literally walked through the atrium in between other shows and saw him playing, and I was like, I can't believe I'm not watching this right now but I can't remember what that conflict was. I did end up seeing Cartel twice, which I was kind of proud of, Jukebox the Ghost twice, all of Andrew's sets. 
and then everything else basically want almost almost all the other artists at least once so how about you guys were there so there were sets that were like favorites when you went to so when you did go to these concerts were there sets that were your favorites i really loved zach's sets I didn't know what to expect if it was going to be Zach with a band or Zach with friends or Zach solo. And by and large, it was mostly Zach solo. But in some ways, it, it kind of feels like going to rock and roll church, sitting through a Zach concert, I think, in some ways. You know, I, I just I, I leave with my spirit a little bit more full than it had been before. I don't know if any of you experienced that getting to see a Zach set. I, I, was, I was sharing that with my brother-in-law, Sean. And then one of the evening sets that Zach was playing with Andrew, it might have been the last night when it was just it was so windy and the fog was all over the place. Zach was playing two two keyboards with his arms stretched out and it, he, he looked an awful lot like rock and roll Jesus in that moment to um and so it felt very full circle from his from his sets earlier in the week but I just I really adored them and he's he played a lot of his new album or songs from his new album that I think is just gonna be so great and so those were that was a really really magical set for me on the night I died by Zach he played it at the two opening something corporate uh his opening something corporate spots in the midwest that I saw him at and then he played it in the atrium it is by far my favorite Zach Clark song and I've only ever heard it live because I there's no studio album version available yet. It's it's amazing. There's a recording of it on YouTube. Somebody shared it with me. I was, yeah, I was gonna say Zach Clark is one of those artists where I I feel like I cannot miss any of his shows because like you said, Mike, they're so just like they hit different, I guess, in a way. But I never think to like seek out his music on a regular basis when I'm like listening on Spotify or what have you. It just kinda comes on shelf. I'm like, Oh yeah, this is a great song. And I go to his concerts and I'm like this is an amazing performance. And then they just like, they're out of my mind immediately. And it's such a bummer because the yeah. shows themselves are so, like you said, they're like magical. And like, he's just like, like you can feel that he's feeling it. And that makes me feel things. <laughs> we were sitting for both of his sets up in the atrium on the second level, or so I guess it's the restaurant. Um, yeah. Oh, she hands. And, and we were sitting on the side of the stage opposite of where Starbucks was on the, the other side. Yeah. And so we could see, it was a little bit of a spoiler, but we could see, especially for Zach and the Zach and Friends set, who was hanging out on the side. And Andrew was there for almost the entire set. And just being able to see the way that Andrew was looking at Zach and how, how he was really just loving what was going on and others who were on the side as well. But it was just, it was like this moment of like, I don't know if it was pride or enjoyment that they had for Zach because he had really captivated the packed atrium. Mm -hmm. It was, it was kind of, it was really uh, something to see. It was jam packed. I, I went to the Zach and friends set, not the other one. Yeah. I was by the bar on the main floor of that atrium uh, I couldn't even get a spot to see fully. So I was like, I had the side view uh, when I walked in because I walked in as it started or maybe even a few songs in and I saw some people that I, I, I knew by the bar. So I just kind of hung out over there. It was interesting, just kind of a, one of these unique things about this boat. First off, I didn't, I didn't say this at the beginning and I really meant to. I was trying to think of a way to describe this atmosphere to people who hadn't done one of these music cruises before. I'm curious about your guys' feedback. So this is kind of a tangent. The best way I can describe this is Take the whole cruise ship element out of it. Picture a street in Nashville, a very short street in Nashville with four or five bars. And there's music playing most of the day or night in each one of these. And some of these are your favorite bands, right? The bands that we're talking about, the artists we're talking about. But it's enclosed. And maybe down the alleys is where we're all staying for those four days. And we can't leave. We're all, you know, so we're all in the same space. But the artists are staying in these little apartment cabins too. And then there's a, and then there's like a cafeteria as well, or a, a restaurant, whatever you want to call it within that. That's the best way I can think to describe this because like, it's so tight knit there. The, yes, there are 2,100 people I heard is how, how many guests they had minus the, you know, that's not including the artists and the crew. So 2,100 people in this area who are kind of all there for the same thing on this block, let's call it. And you're free to move about, but only within that block. And you see the same people sometimes and you see new people sometimes and, but you're all there for the same reason. Do you, do you guys think that might be a good way to describe it? I think I think you're pretty spot on. It definitely was a little bit of a like bubble snow globe moment almost. 
Um, and depending on what I was doing, I felt sometimes like the snow falling or the snow on the ground. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, it was really just like we talked to people and met some, you know, new friends, not friends necessarily, but like we didn't really leave the cruise with all these like new friendships and connections and all that mm -hmm. stuff. But all that being said, just having that like sense of community around us, at least I'll speak for myself, like just knowing that I'm with like my people. I guess mm -hmm. not even if we're not necessarily like talking to friends or meeting or whatever sure. it's like the vibes were like you could feel them you could really feel them and it was like in that little bubble which was a really nice holiday from real if you will <laughs> there it is yeah i i would agree with both of yours assessments in some ways it kind of felt like a family reunion that has never met before <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and that, you know, it was, it, as I was sharing earlier, getting on the first day and being like, I think that's Steve, who I've talked to online a few times, who I've never met in person before. There are so yeah. many of those instances from social media that it was just like, oh my gosh, it's, it's really just the kind, kind of people who are as excited and maybe a little as crazy as we are in this fandom to all in the same spot. And, and so it just, it felt very familial in that sense. I really like what you said about it. It's a family reunion that where you you didn't know all these pe all these family members before. It's like Mike and I. We've we've chatted on Instagram, and it was cool to be like, oh my gosh, you're Mike from Instagram, right around the same time, in almost the exact same spot. Mike, I I met Blaine, who it was an early early something corporate fan out in California, and I've connected with her on Facebook since the Las Vegas show last year. And I was like, oh, it's Blaine. Oh my gosh, nice to meet you. You know, like it's. But in addition to that. There are people I've met at other shows that maybe we've only crossed paths once, maybe twice, because we live in the same area or travel to some of the same places. And I'm like, oh, we, we met at the Pittsburgh show last year. It's nice to see you again. The reason I thought to give that description of kind of what that felt like is because at the Zach, coming back to the Zach Clark show for a moment, I went to the bar to, with some, some of the Midwest uh, folks that I, that I knew prior and they were talking to a guy and I just kind of went up and stood next to um, Caitlin and Laura. We were all enjoying Zach. And I'm like, hey, nice to, oh, it's Clutch. Hi, sir. <laughs> I, you know, from something corporate, I did not know that was Clutch standing right next to me watching the Zach Clark show that they were kind of chatting with. And I was like, uh, oh, here, sir, have a podcast sticker. <laughs> like, <laughs> I did get a chance to meet him after the Cleveland show a few months ago, and I'm certain he didn't remember me, but that's so cool. Like I talked to him in Cleveland after the show and got to tell him great show. And like, I'm just standing next to him watching Zach Clark. It's like such a unique world that's created on these things. And I, I did meet Josh earlier again. I've met him several times, but I met him earlier in the day too, had a chance to chat with him, but it's just like, it's so casual. Like I didn't seek these folks out. I just like came, oh, oh, they're just, they're just standing here because they're fans too. <laughs> like they're just watching the music. Yeah, I, I'd be so curious to get the artist's feedback if like the majority of their interactions felt that way or like, mm -hmm. you know, was it a point of overwhelming at any, at any point in time. The interesting that you bring up Clutch. So he, we were, we, we kind of made our spot uh, in the atrium, that, that second floor level by Yoshi hands. And during the bike lock set, which was amazing, Clutch, you could see Clutch in the back and he was mouthing every single word to their songs. And it was just, you know, it reminded me of like, oh, they're they're fans too. They're not just here to support or mm -hmm. they, they have a real interest and love for the tunes that we get to hear too. And mm -hmm. it was just, it was, a, it was a very wholesome moment seeing it. But he he was super into it, which was so fun to see. I saw Rustin Kelly the first night. That's an artist we haven't mentioned yet here on, the, on this recording. But I'm not the world's biggest Rustin Kelly fan. Like I haven't listened to a whole lot of his music, but I knew some of his songs. He's probably another one like Mr. Wives. I was like, oh, I'm going to listen to his stuff to know. I really do like his Dear Emo album, which is, of course, all covers. So that's pretty easy to get into because I, I know most of the songs prior. Uh, I really like his song Mockingbird, which I think is probably his number one song on Spotify. So again, kind of easy access point. I went to his Dirt Emo set that first night. It was incredible. It was like... I think I'm a Rustin Kelly fan now because of this set. Uh, and the reason I thought to bring that up is because um, Andrew McMahon was standing on the stairs of the atrium watching almost that entire set. And what was also pretty cool, maybe one or two people did, for the most part, people didn't go up to him and say, hey, it's Andrew. You know, He's watching a show like the rest of us. He's just enjoying music. And that was just so, again, I like that wholesome. I'm enjoying Rustin. Andrew's enjoying Rustin. We're enjoying Rustin together. 
someone asked, and I guess we'll come back to this question too. But like, did Andrew just show up in places? Yeah, I just I just saw him places. He was just I feel like he was everywhere in the boat. Firstly, but like, he was at some of the sets just like watching. I, I feel like he was at a lot of the yeah. sets watching, which you know, I, I I wonder what a cruise experience like this must have been for Andrew. You, you have your face plastered everywhere. You have your lyrics staring in shirts on banners. Everybody wants a photo with you. Mm-hmm. So understandably, like if you were to retreat to your cabin, to your suite, you know, to recharge, whatever it might be, like nobody would hold that against you. But the man showed up, I think, to nearly every act. He was at every almost every event. Just like how how generous he was with his time and like <laughs> I, I wonder how how good of a nap he had on the flight back home afterward because i was i was so blown away that how gracious he was with with being present madeline was there a specific set that that stands out to you or a couple of sets that stand out to you non-andrew ones let's go with first okay i think my number one non-andrew set was and i think it's i think with pete's too it was the pool deck mr wives set because mm. like I said, I've been following Mr. Wives for quite a while. I've never been like a diehard fan, but I, I knew them well enough. I knew the songs and everything. I don't know. They were, they just had so much energy at that point, which is saying something. Cause I think Mandy even said at one point that she had been like incredibly seasick all day and mm. they're just cumulative energy and how much fun they were having, despite like the wind that was so bad that they had to like start taking down flags and stuff. It was, it was so infectious and I don't know, something about it was just like, it felt different in a really good way. And I don't know, maybe it's me just being like a nostalgic fan being like, it's almost ending for them. But yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed that. That was really good. The Cartel Chroma set was really good. Although actually, let me take that back. The Cartel set in the atrium, I think it was their last set of the yeah. cruise. Was that, was su- that was such just like, they were just doing their best. They were like having a good time. It just felt very authentic. Not that the other ones didn't, but like those more, I guess, intimate performances all, you know, across all the artists, it just felt so much more, yeah, like genuine. And again, not saying they weren't before or any of them weren't at any point. It's just those little smaller shows where they feel like they can really just like let loose Mm -hmm. felt so much more, I mean, yes, entertaining, but also like, I was like, okay, this, they're, they're just people. They're people who make, great music and just have fun doing it. And I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I was at both of those sets you just mentioned and both blew me away in different ways. Like I said, I've mentioned a couple times, I've, I have I wasn't huge into Mr. Wives, but I've seen them at another festival and enjoyed them and did listen to their music after that point. I, I know the new album fairly well now. Uh, I like that they played several of those songs. They actually played my two favorites off of the new album at that pool deck set. That was the only time I caught them. And what I've realized in these... Um, these festival atmospheres, music festival uh, on a cruise ship atmospheres is that it makes the experience more special watching these bands that you're not quite as familiar with when you're surrounded by their fans. We were hanging out with my wife and I were hanging out with some um, hardcore Mr. Wives fans uh, to at least one of them, I think was there because of Mr. Wives. And it was, it was pretty neat to kind of like bop and dance and like sing along with people who were really big fans and it kind of makes you it kind of brings you in a little bit more like wow these people are really into this like oh okay i can see why go to the cartel show for just a moment i caught most of that i think i missed the first one or two songs but i walked in and that cartel atriums i love the atrium for sets i've heard someone say that's their least favorite venue on the ship i don't know why i know it kind of gets packed if you don't get there early enough, if you don't get into that initial crowd or like Mike had a, had a seat overlooking, which those are those are hard seats to get, by the way, uh, you got to get there early, then you may not have a good view like I didn't for Zach. I had a side view through the bar, <laughs> past the bartenders looking at Zach while he was playing. But I, I do love the atrium when I can get down into the crowd and see the stage because it's it does feel so intimate, as Madeline pointed out, that you just feel like you're all there together. Can I ask you both a question about that cartel set? Mm-hmm. Was it too loud? I feel like the one time I was like an old man on the ship was when we were eating at the restaurant there when they started playing. And I was like, I'm sitting in the back of you in the restaurant. 
And I was like, this is insane. Like I need earplugs. It is just, and so I, I don't, I didn't have that experience with the other bands, but granted, you know, I think bike lock was probably the only one or jukebox that came close, but that cartel set, I was just, I was like, it is too much for me right now. <laughs> It was very loud. And I only remember that because when I heard the first, I guess, like solid drum beat of whatever the first song was they played, I remember thinking, wow, I felt that in my core. <laughs> but I also am a, a horrible to my ears. I do not care if they hurt. I was, I'm, I know I don't wear earplugs. I know I should, but I'm like, I'm not getting the full experience if I don't wear, if I like wear earplugs. So I was just sitting there being bombarded. I was like, well, this is what I'm here for. And I'd rather it be loud, too loud than too quiet. So my my ears were screaming more so than usual immediately mm -hmm. afterwards. But I was like, worth it. But actually for that set, we were probably like facing each other because for Cartel and for, or maybe it was the Zach Clark set, me and Pete were sitting against the railing facing the bar for both of those sets. We got very lucky. So at one point, the three of us were probably all just staring at each other without realizing it. I'll have to go through my photos and see. <laughs> oh my God. That, you know, that is funny when um, you see other people's pictures and you're in them. Someone got video of me. And now she, full disclosure, she told me in the audience, she was like, I got video of you when Andrew came up to you in the in the crowd during synesthesia. And I can talk more about that. But like, I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. She was just recording the song. and <laughs> She wasn't recording me. And she's like, but but if you want that video, I, I'll send it to you. And she did. She And I shared it to Instagram. So it's kind of neat when like, because you're all, again, it's that dome, uh, snow globe thing. It's like, we're all in the same space for so long. It's like, you'll start to see the same people. And even in your pictures, you'd be like, oh, that person was at that show too. I don't know. I wouldn't be shocked after now that we've all talked that like I'm going through pictures or videos. And I'm like, oh, there's Madeline in the background. There's there's Mike sitting uh, at the top of the atrium when I kind of panned around. Like you might have been in my video. I don't know. I did see myself in one of your videos, Steve, actually. It was, but it was the back of me. And I only know it was me because at the, it was the the very first set that Jack's Mannequin set on the pool deck. And uh -huh. I knew it was me because we were standing like behind one of the little hot tub things, which was not a great vantage point, but like I'm a tall enough like lady that I can see over it. But I had this fluorescent baby pink hat on and I saw your video. I was like, I know that hat. I'm like, that can only be <laughs> one person in that hat. And I was like, that's my top. So I got this cute little video because I guess you were shooting down. Yeah. And I could see me just like flapping around my little hat. I was like, it's having so much fun. So oh, I love that. I do appreciate that you got that without knowing it. That And that's exactly what I mean. It's neat to see, like, I don't know if I can think of another example besides synesthesia, but there there were probably moments I was in someone's video. Um, and, and actually, on the opposite end, in that same synesthesia video, um, the, the woman, Kelly, who took that video, she panned around. I didn't realize at first my wife was in it, too. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, my wife looks so happy in that video. I love that. Andrew McCann in the Wilderness is her favorite project of the three. So she was like, we have to be up front. I'm waiting I'm waiting to be up front for this. And she did. It was, she looked so joyful when Andrew walked past her and went back up to the stage. It was, it was really, a really cool thing. I, I love catching those things. That's neat that you caught yourself in one of the videos mm -hmm. I took. I was up top out of the four Andrew sets. I was up top for two of them and I was right up down front, close to the barricade, not on it for two of them. So I kind of, I, I wanted to see kind of both perspectives for Jack's mannequin. I didn't even try because it was, it got so crowded so quick on that first day that I didn't have a choice. Um, and my friends and my wife locked down that, that spot along the railing up above. So I was like, that's great. I will take it. Like I can see, I can see, I will take it. <laughs> For the wilderness set, I think it was, we were back kind of behind. We were actually with the, like, I don't even know. Like, we were with like the am fam group. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Jess turned out to be right there and I didn't realize it till after the cruise. Um, but that vantage point from the railing it was, regardless of whether or not we were behind the stage, it was really interesting to kind of be able to just like see without having to have this like flood of people in front of you and kind of get to not really worry about like, am I in someone's way? Is somebody in my way? Mm -hmm. This person just moved. And kind of have to worry about like the logistics of being in a big group of people. So I feel like the railing was not that bad of a gig. No, not at all. We ended up spending every Andrew set I guess it would be stage left. Actually, I don't know if stage left or stage right. It was the side that normally um, that Josh plays on. Yeah, Partington side. That's what I call oh, it. The Partington, Partington side. side. 
and and for no other reason other than it was nice to have a railing and it was incredible you know if, if you took a few steps three or four steps closer to behind the stage versus the side the sound quality was massively different but it was so fun getting to see the crowd from there even you know while waiting i started playing ship architect of like if i were designing a ship just for concerts how would i do this differently <laughs> and <laughs> there's a few ways right <laughs> right there's a few ways but um it was so fun and we got to meet so many fun people there we got to meet blaine who i think we were near her for the something corporate show and she had shared that was her 119th something corporate show so that about right she was at the early days she was in the early like coffee shop days for something corporate she was waving down to the band as they were walking on and they were like, Blaine, so good to see you. And so I, I don't know if it was, you know, by any stretch or standard, the best spot on Bo, but it worked for us and we got to lean, which was great. Like shout out to leaning. <laughs> yes. How about some, how about some Andrew songs? Were there some songs in the Andrew sets that jumped out at you that you were like, oh my God, I, I wasn't expecting to hear this or I'm so glad he played that one. Well, the, I, I have two at the top of my list, and I wonder if there's any crossover with y'all. Going back to the first time I heard Andrew when I was 15 and getting to hear songs off of Transit, the one that, that stuck out to me the most was Rescued. And I somehow had never managed to hear it live. Um, and it was, I think, so unexpected of, of all the songs in the catalog. I was not expecting to hear Rescued. And, and I'm not overly emotional with when, when I hear a song, but I remember just grabbing my wife's forearm and I was like, oh my gosh, it's happening. And so that that was a really, really special moment for me. And then um, getting to hear Wait during the collaboration set, I had I had missed that in the last two something corporate tours. And so I just adore that song. So And it's always so fun to get to hear Andrew sing when he's not being accompanied by a piano and just a guitar. And, and so to get to hear Wait acoustically was um, was was pretty awesome. Yeah, the deep cuts, they were they were probably my favorite moments, I guess, of his shows. I deeply appreciate how much love he gave people and things because I realize, you know, it's a there's a lot of opinions on it, but there are so many good songs, especially ones he played that like just didn't get their day in the sun when they came out. Like Amelia Jean television that he played hostage when he played hostage, hostage i was like yeah. has he ever played this i ended up looking it up on set list later i think it was like 2012 or something that he played at last i was like justice for hostage so that was amazing um like all the deep cuts just really were special to me but the one that i was most shocked at wasn't like that he played it or anything like that it was my response to it the resolution obviously was like his first kind of big quote unquote song off of I think it was the first single potentially off of Glass Passenger because I think it Swim was. came after that. Yeah. So the resolution, like, it's been around at least in you know my universe forever. I know it. It's it was really great. It's kind of waned to wax for me, but for some reason when he played that on the boat, I got emotional. And like I've heard that song a lot. I've seen him play it a lot. But something about being on the boat, watching him play it, I was like. I'm having one of those snapshot moments where like, I am going to put this in my brain. I'm going to put this feeling in my heart and just keep it forever. If I ever need it again, because I wasn't expecting it. I was like, the resolution. And he got to the chorus. I was like, he's sobbing, <laughs> which is not my usual response to that song. I have like a few Andy songs that I'm like that with, but that's not usually one of them. So it was an interesting reaction I had, I guess, to it. You talk about reactions to songs. I do get emotional in concerts. I get I get maybe overly emotional. I had some emotional responses, but something I didn't expect, a response I had, and I posted about this on Instagram recently, but I, I just got to say it here, that when I heard some of these songs that maybe I didn't expect to hear, hadn't heard in a long time in concert, what was so cool about this podcast is that, about having this podcast, is that I thought of some of the guests that I've talked to about these these songs about. Like when he played Last Straw, Arizona, I thought of this this woman, Marissa, who's been on the show and our conver in that nice conversation we had. And I thought about and rescued as well. Uh, an author named Hazel Jacks has been on the show and I've since met her and gotten to go to a, a show with her and, and her husband. She talked to me about rescued and restless dream uh, as well with her. It's a weird lens to look at this concert and then just be like and think about these people in your life that are only in my life because of this fandom and likely when i think about reflecting on this cruise the two of you will be part of that memory now of like 
thinking back to the cruise mm-hmm. and like the experiences we had. And that's it's just what I love about being part of this this fandom um, and this community. It is just so cool. It kind of all ties together. But that that was the surprising reaction I had. But um, emotionally, I, I'm going to jump to the end of the of the whole cruise. I'm not sure if it had to do with the fact that it was the last set of Andrews of the cruise. Maybe that's why I was feeling more emotional. I couldn't believe when he played Walking on a Dream, the Empire of the Sun cover. That's what made me emotional. <laughs> I was like, I never thought I'd hear it live, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I just, I wasn't expecting, and I like it. But I just, okay, that's not even an Andrew McMahon song. <laughs> but like, I got emotional when he played that. And he, he incorporated Learning to Fly, the cover by Tom Petty, into it as well. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little teary-eyed here. Again, might have had to do with the fact that it was coming to the end of the cruise. The other one, similarly probably, but um, House in the Trees is legitimately one of my favorite Andrew songs of all time. It wasn't a shocker that he played it. I guess it's where he played it and how he presented it. He introduced William Tell back to the stage during the Andrew and Friends set in the last set of the boat. And he talked about how important and special of a friend William Tell is. And I've just never really heard him talk about William. I mean, he did on the Something Corporate tour. He's like, my buddy Will, so glad to have him back. And, you know, but it's just like to think about House in the Trees as and think about maybe his other friends that he's never mentioned in that song. Like there, there's Jamie in the first verse and Aaron in the second. He replaced Aaron in the second verse with William after he told that story and I was like oh my gosh like this is someone that's really special to him and that has come back into his life that was maybe out of his life for a while and has come back into his life this past year a lot more so that made me emotional fortunately there's a video on YouTube of that performance as well I I don't know how much I'm going to go back and watch all these videos Um, I didn't take that one Um, a friend of mine did and I was glad that she did so that I can revisit it when I need to and I, I have I actually I legitimately watched that one the other day and I was like I really, I really like that moment. Yeah, the Andrew and Friends set was, I didn't know what to expect with that set. Yeah. I figured it would be like an Andrew Jam set, but they played some really choice like covers, songs, the cake cover that he did <laughs> yeah. with, with Will. Will. Yeah. That was, that was the epitome of like guys being dudes. Like Will has <laughs> clearly known that song and that verse since he was like 10 years old. He's like, this is my moment to just like show my real talent and it's like, just deep cake lyrics so i just really enjoyed again like i keep saying this like they they all just feel they're having so much fun all the time and it was it just made like at least our experience so much better to be like wow everyone is everyone literally everyone is having a great time and we're all just in the right place with the right people at the right time and it was that set was really yeah that just was kind of the epitome of it to me that was pretty funny. I did take a clip of video of, of Will Will doing that whole verse, and I was mm-hmm. like, my God. Yeah, which is so funny because Dan was just out there. I think they were – what was the police – oh, what was oh, the police on there? Message in a bottle. Message in a bottle. And I was like, I was like, Dan, you should have told him you don't know the words. And then for yeah. Will to get out there and just, like, confidently, loudly, and, like, strongly just do the entire verse of the distance, I was like, all right. Will's, Will's had this in his back pocket for a long time. He wins, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think coming into the fandom as as a relatively young teen and th- there's stories probably true or not around like the hiatus of something corporate and the dynamics between Andrew and the members and even with the various in and outs of the Jackson Wilderness crew and, and throughout all of the sets uh, over the course of the cruise, but particularly on the last night of the collaboration cruise, seeing a very surreal moment of Will playing guitar on a wilderness song or or having Josh on a on a Jack's track. I at some point, I think it was probably during the finale of of the collaboration set, I, I turned to um I turned to my wife and I go, This is my Avengers. You know, I this unlikely group that I was like, I I have loved this music. I carried it with me for the majority of my life. And to see these men coming together and laughing and having fun and bringing these songs to life. It was just, it was, it was, um, it was a very surreal moment in the best way possible. And and for whatever lore had been out there of why the band broke up or whatever the strained relationships are, you know, if the something corporate tour didn't put that to bed, I felt like these sets did. (laughs) Yeah. I asked Josh when in the brief moment I got to meet him on the pool deck, I said, um, wait, have you ever played with Jack's Mannequin before? I didn't think so. He's like, no, that was my friend. I was like, okay, so last night 
when I saw you on stage, Jack, that was the first time you've ever played with them. He's like, yeah. And I was like, that is so cool. Because <laughs> like, there are these firsts that, again, like a lot of these things that we're, gonna, you know, we're talking about here, they're not going to happen anywhere else, you know, outside of this boat. And, and they, they happened in front of our eyes. 